Um, it's kind of a pinch me moment for me because I've been tracking his career since I was younger than I am today. Um, anyway, pop star, film and TV composer, technologist and innovator. Reading through his bio, we're confronted with a dizzying list of accomplishments. I believe that Thomas Dolby is a great example of at least one model for how to navigate the world of audio, a combination of, of all of the things, technologist and artistic. Since the fall of 2014, Thomas has held the post of professor of the arts at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and he's recently released his first book called The Speed of Sound. And so, without further ado, actually I'm gonna do something that may seem a little bit backwards, but I am, would like to present to you Thomas Dolby. Hello. <laughs> yes. Wait, wait, wait for it. A certificate of appreciation to Thomas Dolby for delivering the keynote address and for everything we're about to hear from us, the conve from all of us. So please accept this in advance, thank and you. thank you so much for being here. You might want to just save that till after the talk. <laughs> and now, do we need a drum roll? Please welcome Thomas Dolby. I am able to do this, not because I ran away to the circus when I was 10, which would have been nice, but I'm able to do this because I'm a human being, because in our species, we have this innate ability to create this neural loop between our brains and the pads on the tips of our fingers. And we can do this not only as individuals, but also as a swarm. And I'm aware of this every day when I walk past the Peabody Orchestra rehearsing at my school, because that's what's happening when orchestral musicians play together. Each one of these young musicians is finally tuning the tips of their fingers in response to their open strings, to the neighbors, to the open piano lid, the ringing timpani, the space under the stage, until the entire stage becomes a sounding board. And they're playing together in a sort of collective consciousness. And so for the next hour, I just want to talk a little bit about this phenomenon, because in the audio world, we have folders of WAV files. These WAV files are very clever. They can stop, start, pause, maybe loop. You can line them up with a fader each and in the hands of a great programmer or engineer. You can blend them into something resembling nature, resembling the sound of musicians playing together be it a band or an orchestra. But these files have no knowledge of each other at all. They're dumb, they don't listen, they just do as they're told, hopefully. They have no knowledge of the context in which they're playing. So this is a standard industry file format, and this is the single unit of currency for our entire community, and it's been that way for years. Because most of the tools that we make are geared up for combining these disparate elements into a single stream, be it stereo, 5.1, whatever it is, in order to make a record, mix the soundtrack for a movie, but the output is always linear. Most of the tools that we make and the plugins are designed to process these disparate elements in one way or another. But they're dumb elements, they're building blocks, they're like Lego blocks. And so when I'm programming these things, I feel a lot like a bricklayer. 
But this is not what happens in nature. If you think about schools of fish, you think about a murmuration of starlings, and you think about herds of animals on the plain, the way they move together. Each one of them is making minute incremental decisions that they don't stop to think about. When I'm balancing that broomstick, I'm not thinking left a bit, right a bit. It would probably fall. These decisions happen on a, on a minute basis, and we pass them on to each other. And in different fields of endeavor, this phenomenon is being studied and used to enhance technology and entertainment. Like this experiment in the UK, where they're actually tracking individual fish in a school and turning their movements and their interactions with their neighbors into an algorithm. Or the study of swarms of insects. Or flocks of birds that can be turned into an algorithm and used in other areas. Areas like video games or robotics where these cute little zoids are using swarm technology to self-organize according to a sort of meta instruction from the programmer. And in video games, you have autonomous armies who are using AI and flocking algorithms to organize themselves and funnel through this tunnel. And of course, in the movies, where would a movie like Lord of the Rings be without artificial intelligence? So in many other fields, nesting, flocking, swarming, is being studied and used to create a better approximation of nature. But in our industry, folks, we have folders of AIFFs. Until quite recently, if I was asked to compose the soundtrack for a game, they would give me a list of assets in a database, and I would deliver WAV files and then hope that couple of months down the road, an engineer would have implemented them properly into the game. That is improving. But it drives me nuts that in our industry, we're still dealing with these linear file formats that belong to a different era, the 20th century era of linear entertainment. And look what's been happening over the last few years. The output is no longer primarily linear. If a, if a, a teenage gamer is playing a Twitch game, he or she is doing what I was doing with my fingertip times 100. And as a composer, how can I score for that with linear file formats and tools designed for a linear output? I can't do it. I can't enhance that the way I would enhance something rigid like a video scene. So, I mean, it seems to me that as an industry, we're a little bit behind. But I actually think that's a good opportunity for us to leap ahead as an industry and come up with some new standards and formats that will actually enable development in this area and a change of the focus for the hardware and software companies and the creatives in our community. I mean, a good start, for example, is a Rex file. Now, Rex, as you may know, is a proprietary file format which is used in Propellerhead Reason, in Logic, um, uh, in Ableton, and so on. And it has the advantage that you can take a beat like this and break it up into its individual components so that tempo and key are somewhat independent of each other. And that means that I can drag a new beat into, a temp into the wrong tempo of sequence, and it will make that adjustment. This is a good start. But it's a proprietary format which is licensed to various different manufacturers, and so it hasn't held back development in this area but it hasn't exactly encouraged new development and innovation either. When I had my company Beatnik in Silicon Valley in the 90s, we had a proprietary file format called RMF. Uh, it was relatively successful in that it shipped in about two billion mobile phones, but it was a proprietary format and the only way you could make an RMF file was with a Beatnik tool. Sounds like a VC's dream of a business plan, right? We managed to screw it up anyway. Um, 
but uh, the, the reason that RMF was never adapt, adopted widespread was that it was not open, it was not extensible, we didn't encourage third parties to work in that area. So I mean, I would actually like to see a new kind of format that I think of as a more conscious audio file format. So some ideas for what could be in this format include multi-track waveform, not just stereo or 5.1 or whatever. It could be have n number of separate tracks or stems. Options for different compression, AAC, MP3, etc. And so lossless ones. It would declare its transients, its peaks and troughs and so on. It would declare its loop and cue points, its polyphony, its key signature, its tempo, and possibly also what gets priority if you have to duck something? Do you have to take the whole volume down or maybe just the upper registers and leave the beat going? It could have a sort of pre-roll declared if there's, for example, a, a sort of leading note, a passing note or a reverse symbol leading into the downbeat. It can have characteristics for release. Can we just cut this off on a downbeat or does it have to tail off naturally? And then some more uh, generic um, Fields such as genre and subgenre, the group of instruments it belongs to, maybe the mood and the emotion, and copyright and things like that. I don't know all of the parameters that should go in there, and I'm not suggesting that I have the answer, but I think that collectively, as a community, we could sit down at a table and figure out what some of the requirements would be for such a file format. So if this were to come to exist, then what would it actually do for us? What would it facilitate? Well, it could give us seamless transitions between themes. It's very annoying in a game when you get those sort of clunky changeovers. Could do beat matching, nested loops within loops, internal variations perhaps to sustain interest for a, an a uncertain period of, of time, independent key and tempo so that you could match up key and tempo to whatever's currently playing, uh, vertical muting and unmuting of tracks and stems, integration down the road into DAWs and MIDI sequences, etc., which, let's face it, are kind of somewhat plateaued at this point. You know, the, the Pro Tools and the logics of the world of having trouble adding valuable new features with each new thing they put out. If there was a file format and a standard like this, it would give them a new area to work in. It could give you the possibility of taking a light motif approach to composition where you have independent themes like Peter and the Wolf for different characters. It could give you, it could result in more poignant and compelling soundtracks, and it would open up the possibility of interactive music teaching and learning, even in high schools and colleges. So the long and the short of it is that I'm fed up with being a bricklayer. I want to be a conductor. I want to be Gustavo Dudamel. I mean, let's face it, we evidently have the same barber. Though not everybody is impressed. But listen to his musicians. They're all doing the broom juggling thing in real time. And it adds up to something which, when it's working, is as beautiful as watching a school of fish. So, rant over. So for the last few years, I've been working at Johns Hopkins University and currently out of the Peabody Institute, which is the oldest music conservatory in the USA. Uh, it's been around longer than Juilliard and any, any of those guys. It's been part of Johns Hopkins for the last 40 years or so. And this is the perfect place to study this problem because it's a top 10 university, because it's a venerated music conservatory, because it already has one of the best recording arts programs in the country, maybe the world, and I know this because I, I researched them at length for my college-age son. And it's part of a wider university, which is one of the top hospitals and medical campuses in the USA. There's all sorts of collaborative possibilities with the neurology department, with people doing great work in the area of music and wellness with the Film and Media School in Station North, which is what I originally came to Baltimore to help uh, open for Johns Hopkins. 
And the Film and Media Center, which we built in a uh, beautiful old Art Deco cinema in the Station North area of Baltimore, is a pretty rundown and poverty-stricken area. And this is a, a kind of a bit of an issue, really, because if you look at the fees charged by top universities, it costs an arm and a leg to send your kids to college. <clears throat> and the relative changes in college tuition fees have no way kept step with the overall consumer price index. They're just absolutely through the roof. It'll cost you the price of a small apartment to send your kid to a public school, let alone a private school. Well, maybe not a small apartment in Manhattan, but um, a small apartment nonetheless. And if you go the full distance, you're going to probably run up debts, which is going to take you years to repay, even if you ever get to repay them. And I feel very much that the advances in technology should be a way, not for the universities to see the, this as a new profit center, but as a way to make their education more accessible to a wider range of people. I feel that otherwise, you know, for all but the most privileged in our society, college is really a no-go zone. And the lack of a college degree just perpetuates the cycle of poverty. I mean, for decades, for centuries, in the case of my country, uh, my country, universities have been able to operate as a sort of oligopoly, like the rule of the few. And that, to me, is a warning sign, because that, to me, means they could go the way of the taxi companies, the record industry, and even hotel chains. So the question is, is Johns Hopkins going to be the next yellow cab company? Or is it going to be more like the music industry? It took the music industry forever to realize that people weren't really interested in the logos of EMI and Warners and Sony and Universal. Music was a lot more simple than that. Music was more like a musician setting up in the town square and asking for tips from the audience that gathered round so that at the end of the day, he could afford to go shopping. But I mean, if you look at what's happened, for example, to hotel chains, getting disintermediated, or Netflix and Blockbuster, you wonder whether a college-age kid at this point in time is really going to want to go to university. Because part of the issue with college kids is that, you know, when we were all kids, you needed the answer to a problem. You would go to the library, you'd look it up, you'd solder something together and try and come up with a solution. Well, for many college-age kids these days, if there's a problem, the solution is just a few key presses away on their device. And th the issue with that, really, is that they never learn to think outside the box, and they never learn how to circumnavigate those problems creatively, which is what brings out your individuality as a creative musician. So when I was college age, I left school at 16, by the way, there were no university programs that were really appropriate for me in the UK to go and learn electronic music or experimental film, so I pretty much sat in my bed sitter most of the day and night working on my music. And when I did go out into the streets, it was way too exciting. This is what was going on in London in the late 70s. The soundtrack was punk rock, the Sex Pistols and The Clash and Elvis Costello. And there was a general strike and on the street corners, there was garbage piling up in dumpsters. And it was in one such dumpster in Putney, South London, that I found this circuit board, which turned out to be the innards of a synthesizer called a Transcendent 2000. So with the help of a circuit diagram from Popular Mechanics magazine and a soldering iron, I was able to put together my first synthesizer. It had no keyboard, of course, but I was quite content to just twiddle knobs and hit buttons and make sound that way. My second acquisition was this lovely vintage Revox tape recorder. And uh, it had the capability to bounce channels back and forth. So I was able to sort of beatbox onto the left channel and then bounce it to the right channel while adding a second sound. And the music was fairly primitive. But of course I went from two to four and got myself a Tiak Porter studio. And the music correspondingly became a little bit more sophisticated. And then I went from four to eight. I got myself a Roland Jupiter 8. And with it, I put together a multimedia stage show. Hey, I was 14. 
And then, of course, eight became 16. And this beast was a PPG 340-380 wave computer that was designed to turn Tangerine Dream's light show on and off. And it, it had a pair of micro cassettes that you would load into the front of the, of the box for every song. And then you would type on the QWERTY load return and wait 52 seconds. You had about roughly even's chance that if you then hit play return, it would play. So, any chops I have at public speaking came about in increments of 52 seconds in sweaty, smoky clubs in South London, uh, circa 1979. Um, at one point, I was actually thinking of getting a second one of these and syncing them up so I had 32 channels. So I was sort of buying into this Moore's Law theory, you know, that things get better every time you double stuff up. Every time you go from 16 to 32, your life gets better, right? Well, I mean, when I look back at my career and I realized that wasn't actually the case. A lot of the best stuff I ever did was when my resources were very limited. Case in point, I was working as a busker in Paris, sitting on my backside in the metro playing Bob Dylan songs, when I got a call from New York City from Mick Jones. And I thought, The Clash, yes! It turned out to be a different Mick Jones. Um, <laughs> who I knew very little about. You know, I sort of thought of Foreigner as a, you know, sort of dinosaur rock band, but they were very nice chaps. And they flew me over to New York and I lived around here and went down to Electric Lady Studios every day where they were already on a deadline to get Lou Graham's vocals finished for the album. Um, they'd already put synthesizers on the album, but they'd heard my demos and they thought that maybe I could contribute something. So to hedge their bets, they put me in a back room at Electric Lady where there was an eight track tape machine. They would do a little slave mix of each multi-track down to stereo, which left, left me six tracks to play with. And in the back room at Electric Lady, they had this lovely Neve, it was like an 8068 sidecar or something like that. And my axe at the time was a monophonic micro moog. <laughs> One note at a time, folks. But I'd always wanted to play with this idea that I had when I first saw um, the Beatles working with the Mellotron. And John seems very happy with a new sound he's discovered on his Mellotron. As you know, a Mellotron has a, a tape loop or a piece of tape for every single note. So you play middle C and it plays you a flute playing C and play a chord, you've got Strawberry Fields Forever. I always had this idea that you could do that with synths. So I used the six tracks that I had on the eight track and I played single notes in the key of, I think it was E minor, in a scale, uh, sustained single notes with the micro moog, and then using the faders on the Neve sidecar, I sort of played my electronic Mellotron, and this was the result. So I was 22 and I got about that far in the song and I played it for the band and there was sort of, I turned it off and I looked around the control room and there was sort of a, a pregnant pause at the end of which the bassist said, it's a bit like massage music, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, Mick Jones and uh, um, Matt Langer, very much to their credit, decided that it sounded like a hit to them. And so they left it on. And uh, to this day, 35 years later, I'll be in a rental car, you know, in Madison, Wisconsin. And I turn on the FM radio and there is my massage music. And that feels pretty good. Um, so, that, I mean, the question is, you know, when you're talking to today's generation of students, how do you instill in them that this kind of 
limited resource creativity can lead to good results. Because at their fingertips, they've got the answers to everything, right? They've got in their laptop way more powerful equipment than we ever had at Electric Lady back in whenever it was. And so there's always an, a solution. There's always a way to find a YouTube video of somebody who solved the problem for you or download the user manual, God forbid. Maybe post a message on a forum and by morning you've got a dozen answers. So I deliberately try and take them out of their comfort zones and give them limited resources to work with and force them to circumvent those things. You learn by failing, right? So that sort of gave me a way in to my time at Peabody where I'm surrounded by these wonderful faculty, incredible musicians, Marion Allsop and Leon Fleischer and so on and this great recording arts department. There are over a thousand performances every year at Peabody and many of the recording arts students get to record them so they get real great hands-on experience miking up, mixing um, and so on. And Peabody is turning out large numbers of fabulously talented classical musicians. Far more, in fact, than there are professional seats in orchestras. So these guys are either going to end up with a Johns Hopkins degree under their belt and go into a different career altogether and just do music as a hobby, or they may end up teaching piano to their neighbor's kids. Good luck paying back hundreds of thousands of dollars of student fees debt, you know, doing that. So one of the things that I think is a, is a key to this for all universities is that a lot of the work that we do doesn't actually require the brick and mortar space that we're in. That's where a lot of the overhead comes from. A lot of the, music, a lot of the information can be conveyed electronically. So one of the things we've been doing, for example, is putting some basic stuff online, not only for our own students, but perhaps one day in the future, as Berkeley School of Music does and various others, making this open and accessible to the general public. So in the spring, for example, I taught a course in tech for classical musicians. And this was really based around the iPad. So for under a thousand bucks, you can be working with this kind of software. You can use it to enhance uh, your rehearsal, your arranging skills, and so on. And I had office hours once a week where the students would just log in and I would demonstrate stuff for them uh, on the iPad. And this is using techniques that the students are very familiar with, having seen YouTube tutorials and so on, but doing it in a slightly more controlled manner. So that means that we can concentrate the time that we have in our brick and mortar facilities, uh, such as our lovely control rooms, to really give them hands-on experience uh, with the nuts and bolts of the, uh, of the recording arts side. We have a brand new gorgeous Lavo console, We've got a classic Neve V, We've got great recording spaces, and this year we've added my multimedia, uh, new media lab, uh, with some incredible partnerships we've been able to pursue with people like Roland, um, JBL who provided a, a 9.2 speaker system, with Dolby Labs who gave us a Dolby Atmos encoder, with HTC Vive who have given us wireless um, uh, VR headsets and so on. We built out a beautiful lab. Now, it's been amazingly encouraging the response that we've gotten from students and parents. It's the first major US university that would offer both a, con a conventional uh, conservatory education with core subjects in theory and arrangement and sight reading and so on, uh, alongside a, a more tech-oriented um, uh, training program. Um, it's also not hard to persuade the parents and the students that this is a good investment in their careers because it will open up new career paths for them. And some of my students are avid gamers uh, and they're very excited to be able to do a program, a uh, degree course like this because of the opportunities that they see in the games world. But even if you've been playing Mario since you were 10 years old and your ultimate ambition is to write platform game music, I still feel that you start by learning the fundamentals of film and TV scoring. We have a 100-year legacy of this kind of scoring uh, for film and TV. It's very well evolved and developed. Um, over the years, uh, as more and more electronics, sample libraries, and so on have come into the scoring world, um, the tools that the film composer has at their disposal are more and more powerful. And this is important because as you gain 
skills as a film or TV composer, you have to learn to pivot because you're working on a rough cut of the movie and you find out that you're actually supposed to be working with a more recent cut from this week in which a whole three minute scene is gone from the film. The producers have decided it's like winter, not summer. It's a gay couple, not a straight couple, those kinds of things. And you have to be able to pivot on the spot as a composer. But the issue really is that once you start getting into games and virtual reality, it's not some producer or editor somewhere that's making those decisions, it's the player. Because the player is choosing how they choose to spend their time. And so how do you put all of the smarts and the skills that you've gained from the linear world of film and TV, how do you get those working in real time in a game engine? That's the challenge. And I don't have all the answers for that. The students are gonna to have to navigate that problem along with me. And the best thing that I have to give them is when you hit those obstacles, how do you circumnavigate them? How do you find ways around them? We are the ones that are gonna be writing the rule book. There is no user manual for this stuff. So the first question that I asked them at the beginning of the course is, why use music at all? You know, why do we put music in, in film and TV? And there's a whole slew of answers, which I won't go into here, but there's a whole bunch of reasons why you would want to include music along with picture in the first place. So all of those reasons carry over into the game world. Now, they will get lots of experience in the first year or so of the degree, creating their own musical cues along with scenes from movies and TV. But increasingly, towards the end of the first year of a four-year degree, they'll be looking at how do you do this in a non-linear environment such as Unity. I'm sure many of you know that many games that come out these days are built not on proprietary game engines from the different companies, but on standard game engines such as Unreal and Unity. Now, these are environments in which all of the different elements of the game, such as the graphics, the animation, the gameplay, and so on, come together in a single project. And there's good news about this, which is that as a composer, it's possible to get messages from the gameplay which you can interpret in your music in order to create an interactive soundtrack. So very often the physics of the game itself will allow you, for example, to create zones which you can use to trigger different aspects of the music. You know, you could open and close different uh, uh, stems within the music. You could choose to do a more sort of horizontal, horizontal approach where you're cross-fading between cues as people move around. And I was talking to a bunch of, I don't know, 15-year-old gamers the other day, um, and I, I was hoping that they use the music in their games, that they leave it on, because when I started doing game sound about 20 years ago, we would do user testing behind a one-way mirror, which is a great night out, by the way. Um, and we would watch what they did, and one of the first things they did was turn off the music and put in their iP iPods or, or Walkman or whatever they were back then. But what the gamers were telling me recently, these teenage, teenage gamers, was that because some games use the game engine itself to trigger the music, if you want to score high in the game, you listen very carefully to the music because the music will cue you when the bad boss is coming around the corner with a more powerful weapon or when you're running low on, on, um, on health or if you've got more adversaries than friendlies in the space. So this is very good news because you know, the music is becoming more and more a crucial part of the whole experience, which we like to hear as composers, right? We don't like to be second-class citizens. Um, but the challenge really is that if you are, let's say, a, a teenage composer just starting out and you want to hone your chops or you're doing music tech in high school or at college level, how do you practice this stuff? Because Unity, although you can download it for free, it's a pretty high level of scripting and programming required to be useful in it. It's very easy to break things. So the question is, you know, how do you practice this stuff? Unless you're actually actively involved in a game development project with a local company and they will let you into their project, which is very unlikely, um, then it's very hard to get any practice doing this. So enter a very handy piece of middleware, which we've been messing with in my program, which is called WISE. And WISE is a, a middleware component which plugs into Unity and Unreal and so on and will give a musician or sound designer much more intuitive 
tools with which to trigger and control the soundtrack. And so I'm fortunate to have from Audio Kinetic, uh, which is a Canadian company that make Wise, uh, a young man who's going to show us a demo of a very promising environment which they've created, which is free to download. So I would encourage anybody to go in and take a look at it after this and mess around with it. It's a game environment and a sandbox which will allow you as a sound designer or a composer or as a technologist to mess around with a game engine in real time. So please welcome from Audio Kinetic, Ryan Dunn. Thank you very much, Thomas. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for uh, having us on stage to give, give everyone a demo here. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Ryan from Audio Kinetic. Uh, Thomas has already done a pretty good job at explaining to you why I'm here today, but um, if I could sort of reframe the why, what can you do to get involved in interactive audio to try it out? And uh, we like to do that by sort of giving you the hypothetical of imagining you've got your first video game audio project. Uh, maybe you're used to working with Pro Tools or Linear DAW in cinema and music. And we expect that you're going to run into a bunch of problems that you've never dealt with before. Um, you've maybe composed some epic boss fight music with a big crescendo. Uh, but there's no guarantee that the player is going to hear that, that uh, music. They might instead just enjoy the nice waterfall outside of the scary boss cave and, uh, and just chill out there. Um, you might be very worried about your mixing and mastering. You don't know at any particular one time what sounds are going to be playing on top of each other, so mastering and mixing becomes tricky. And um, spatial audio and physically realistic sound becomes a huge priority. What ties these issues together, like Thomas was saying, is that you're, you're now going to be responsible as a creator for how the sound behaves. And that's really where WISE comes in. So I've got a demo here of our uh, WISE Adventure game. Uh, this is, as uh, Thomas mentioned, an open source uh, project and tool that sort of shows off how our software uh, works with, with gameplay. And I want to show you a, a sort of single minute type of sound behavior that you have control of and the kind of creative decision there. And that we'll, we'll, we'll use that as a launching point uh, to, to further this demo. So I'm in a nice woodland area in my game. And I'm, we're just concentrating on the ambience right now. Obviously, in, during gameplay, you would hear music and action sounds. But right now, just, just listen to the background. There's frogs and birds. and. I can change the time of day in my game. And now we hear crickets and a hoot of an owl. Uh, sometimes there's a, a, a wolf that howls quite loudly. It's a little bit creepy. So let's suppose... Oh, there you go. Back to the daytime. Let's uh, suppose for creative decisions, maybe uh, your writer decided the character should, should uh, be a werewolf or something that... Yeah. Their uh, voice sound that you can hear as I attack should change when it becomes nighttime. So I'm going to welcome you back to Wise here. Uh, there's a lot going on on the screen, I'll, I'll grant you that, but there's a few important points that you need to know to just sort of make my point, and that's that we're worried about a particular sound of the, the character swinging their sword there, and I have a mapping of the voice pitch of that sound to the time of day. And so I can bring the voice pitch down during the night time. And Wise is connected to the game in real time. So we hear her voice in the daytime. Uh, but as I switch to night, it's deeper. Now I'm told often, I mean, I'm a little younger, that uh, in 1998, the turnaround to do that would have been like a day. You would have changed parameters in your DAW and then gone and asked your programmer nicely, could you integrate this into the game? And I'll play this for you again. Oh. Uh, I changed the pitch parameter too low. Mr. Programmer, could you, uh, or Mrs. Programmer, could you, could you please uh, change it back? Um, and fortunately, it's not going to take another day to make that change. Back in Wise, we can sort of fi fine tune this adjustment. 
very nicely and get a more subtle pitch shift effect. Hi! So we can hear the day again to compare? Yeah! Cool. Now, taking that as a, a starting off point, I've got a limited time here, but I, what I want to jump to is what a fully fledged example of this kind of work looks like. We've done one small creative decision with the behavior here, and uh, a culmination of all that work, I think, is uh, best demonstrated with interactive music and, uh, that responds to player and enemy proximity and environment and stuff. So I'm going to jump to another area in the game where we can hear just that. Uh, listening to the sort of ambient desert music, as you've heard, and there's some uh, enemies over here, and listen as I get closer to the enemy how different elements are introduced. Everything's in time, it's cooperating. Uh, as I walk away, there isn't an awkward time shift. And there's a second enemy down here that changes the theme to sort of a, a, a theme C. Don't worry, I'm in a sort of an invincible mode, so they can't hurt us today. One of my favorite music themes in the Wise Adventure game is a transition to the caverns up here. And I'll, I'll sort of finish off the demo by showing, showing you that. So listen as, listen as I walk from the desert uh, down into this cavern. Now, I'm going to leave you here, so it's up to you to, to go check out the Wise Adventure game and find out what lies for us in that cavern there. Um, but I want to let you know that Wise is free to download and try. You can download it and play and experiment with it. And the Wise Adventure game, as well as our Wise Audio Lab and Unreal, are open source projects that you can download and hack. You can connect them to Wise and change the sound material, compose your own score or uh, character voice events. And if you, if you think you're going to have trouble figuring that out, we have courses and certification programs with online resources that are free to sort of help you out. Uh, lastly, I'll sort of plug our website, other game samples that we have, our YouTube channel. And uh, feel free to email us or reach out. And my colleague and I will be at a uh, conference all week. So if you see us around, come say hi. And um, I hope you all are sort of inspired to at least check out interactive audio and explore the sort of creative possibilities there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so go check out Wise. Um, I feel that you know the neat thing about a demo like this is that each of us have different skill sets and different perspectives on things, and everybody brings something else to it. So I think in this room, there's a lot of people that could extend this environment and contribute stuff you know, back into the hole. But the main thing is this makes it very, very easy to jump in there. And you might think, oh, the music sucked. And well, OK, so go in and make your own music, right? Replace it. It's very easy to just cut and paste your own files in there. So in 1993, I was invited by uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Soho to create a virtual reality installation called the Virtual String Quartet. <clears throat> and we were using at the time some rather primitive equipment, such as this very sexy head-mounted display. Um, I think an IBM 286 uh, was running on with a card with, uh, called a Convolvatron. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the sound was great. We had a Mozart string quartet, which you could move around, you could stick your head in the cello, you could tickle the viola player. Um, they would start playing Appalachian bluegrass instead of Mozart, and, and the sound was great. The, the graphics were horrible. Uh, it was this clunky sort of three frames a second or something like that. We had a line around the block in Soho, an hour and a half to get in, and nobody came back. And. Uh, <laughs> When I finished that experience, I, I vowed off virtual reality forever. Uh, and I was done with virtual reality, I retired from it. So uh, a couple of years 
ago, I got back into it. And so I was really the first person, I think, to do a Frank Sinatra in virtual reality and uh, get back into it. And the reason was that as we started thinking about the new media music degree course at Peabody, we realized that VR would be a big part of this. Now, many of my students have got VR systems at home. So they're already doing things like Beat Saber and these sort of Twitch games, um, uh, shoot 'em ups and so on. Uh, when I started looking at the content that was available, I could see that the graphics were improving very, very rapidly and the experience is now very immersive. There was some great spatialized 3D sound happening in my headphones. But the issue was that other than the shoot 'em up games and the Twitch games, most of the more imaginative, more relaxing games that somebody of my advanced years might enjoy, um, the problem with them was that there was no interactivity at all. They were just these sort of beautiful empty spaces with nothing much to do. Um, and part of the reason for that is that, you know, artificial intelligence has not yet advanced to the point where we can have characters you can interact with. There's therefore no storyline per se. There's no storytelling. There's no drama, emotion. These are the kind of things that a composer scores, right? So how is I going to teach my students to write music for these kind of spaces? I mean, writing massage music um, for these kind of spaces. But I was very pleased um, a few months ago to see something that made me think that maybe this was all about to change. And that's my job, right? That's what I did with electronic music, I hope, with music video, um, with music on computers, music on the web in the 90s, music on mobile phones in the 2000s. It's kind of my job to dive into places where I have no right to be at all and get creative with them. So this is why I'd like to show you this. And it's very primitive and very early days. But there is a virtual reality platform called High Fidelity at highfidelity.com, which I'm very keen on. And the reason is, once again, it's open source, it's extensible, it's very, very well documented API, which has audio and MIDI capabilities right in the API. And one of the things that I like about it is that there is a, a, a community of early adopters that are using this. It's still in beta, they haven't really pulled the trigger on it yet. And among that community, I found a group here in New York uh, called Alive in Plastic Land. And what they'd been doing is they'd been putting actors into a VR head-mounted display with sensors on their hands and feet and having them act out theatrical scenes, in this case, a scene from Julius Caesar. For I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for darkness than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile tracks by any indirection. I can say to you, for gold, to pay my lead to pressure, I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I fool that brought my answer back. My heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes my greater than they are. Do not till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. Okay, so you see what's going on here, right? So the point of view on the screen is this actor's point of view. He's not actually in the same room as the other actor, but he is interacting with the avatar of the other actor. He's able to use his full body language and so on. So this is obviously quite clunky. Right? It's sort of like the graphics were in games, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, but Moore's Law is going to take care of that in due course. But the idea of acting like this in VR was very exciting to me because suddenly now you have the possibility of character, personality, storytelling, narrative, emotion, drama. Brings you back to that slide that I showed you of asking the students why use music. Right? It, they have to answer all of those questions now in a, in a real-time environment. So what, would this give, what would, does this give us if we do acting in VR? Well, it's obviously great for rehearsing and blocking theater and TV and movies, even if your actors are not in the same place. They can be anywhere. A few hundred dollars of consumer equipment is what they're using. You know, the head-mounted displays are maybe five or six hundred dollars. They're using a graphics PC that they already have and a few sensors that are, I don't know, $90 a pop. So that means that if you're able to move into full productions using this equipment, you would have almost zero overhead. 
And it's very scalable. You can have a global audience in virtual reality. And that audience can participate and interact with the actors, maybe doing iterative theater like um, Tony and Tina's wedding or, or those kinds of things. Uh, the outcomes are unpredictable, which makes for a very cool challenge for my students. And finally, we have a great reason to compose a musical score, but it needs a format for adaptive music and 3D sound, other than taking a folder of WAV files and triggering them based on events within the game. So I decided with my class at Peabody that we needed a sandbox to play around in. Just like the adventure game from Wise for games, we needed a VR sandbox to play around in. And I was able to talk highfidelity.com into gifting us this rather gorgeous island in virtual reality. Now, my students are not graphics designers and programmers, so it was great to be gifted this, allowing them to focus on the sound and music. But using their API, it's possible for us, for even my students, to go in and write little scripts or cut and paste their own uh, links, their own music and sound into the game. So I'm going to show you, sticking with the day and night theme, I'm going to show you our island during the day and during the night. In High Fidelity, as I mentioned, there's an amazing community of programmers working in a variety of different areas. And one of the people that I met, and I met him in VR, his avatar just wandered over to me and started talking to me. Turned out he was in Milan, Italy, and he is a, an Italian TV producer by the name of Lucio Pascarelli, and his sister is an actress. And they make real uh, Italian kids TV episodes using this same consumer equipment. They have a sort of Sesame, type, Sesame Street type show in Italian, and they have some animation, and it turned out to be cheaper for them to produce their animation by putting actors in head-mounted displays than it was for them to go to a studio or get animators to do it. So Lucio and I were talking about it, and he came up with a very cool idea, which is that really anybody could take the part of one of these actors. And so he set up a, an event on this island where a couple of his actors acted out a scene from a soap opera and the audience were allowed to go in and participate and view it from any angle. Re represented not as avatars but as small pale spheres so they wouldn't interfere with the actors. And this is the result. After that, you're gonna see what happens to the island at night, which is also quite interesting. So we're going to zoom into this island here. And this is the output from the computer, and we're going to see what Lucio has to say. But we're trying to see how close we can get to a theater scenario. Um, both actors are used to theater. Uh, they've been used to all sorts of things happening in theater, people jumping on stage. So they're, they're going to be able to cope with that. Um, then they're going to come here. There's going to be another bit of a scene. And then there will be a third part of the scene, which is going to take place uh, in front of the, of the um, cafe over there. So, I guess we need to the grandpa. Let's right. start again. And that's how everybody's okay. kind of invisible. Action! Look, she doesn't hate you, all right? We need to talk about this. We really do. This is all we ever talk about. Don't you get it? It's, it's never going to be about me and you. It's all about her. She's coming. She's dying, Isabel. What? Yeah, she's dying. She's got... Maybe a couple of months left. Oh, God. Do, do the kids know? Well, not yet. But after nightfall, the island is transformed. In San Francisco, California, in about 12 minutes' time, a dozen or so innocent mortals are going to don these HTC Vive headsets and run around this space here, trying to escape the clutches of brain-eating zombies. And I am the live composer for this. So using a combination of my keyboard sounds and these pads here, which make sounds like these, I'm going to actually create a live interactive soundtrack to the game. So the clock is ticking and very soon we're going to get started with Escape from Zombie Island. Disgusting. Oh, I don't like that. 
So I'm up here on my platform, the eye of God playing the music. But right now I'm going to walk off the edge and go down into the streets with the mortals and the zombies. As far as we know, that's the first ever uh, performance of, a, of an interactive score for VR in VR. But, as you can tell, I'm dealing with pads triggering a bunch of WAV files. And you could, you could tell me that, okay, something like WISE and Unity, I could actually trigger those sounds based on messages from the game, and you'd be right. Because it's certainly not very scalable to have one composer you know, playing for maybe 26 people in VR at a time. But the issue really is that that job would be made infinitely more difficult by the fact that these individual samples that I'm triggering have no sense of context, they have no knowledge of each other. So once again, I would like to have a way to actually link all of those together and have them learn about each other, have them listen to each other like the players in an orchestra. The other thing is that, you know, I had my headset on and I was sort of grasping around like a mole for my pads and that maybe what I need is something more intuitive, like this rather wonderful vision which Sennheiser put together. Using the Magic Leap headset.
So um, I haven't talked to anybody from Sennheiser about this, so I hope you don't mind me showing you a demo. I would love it if there was a demo like this on the show floor here, maybe next day, yes. But I think it gives you an idea that, you know, the controls for this stuff need to be more intuitive. You know, we're still based very much around the user interface metaphor that was handed down to us from the era of analog tape and mixing boards with lots of faders and knobs and so on. And those kinds of interfaces are not always appropriate for the kind of work that I'm talking about in the internet interactive space. Also, my students have grown up with these skills to use these controllers and, you know, to force them to go back and learn this previous era is instructive and it's certainly worth doing to see where it all came from, but we need to provide a more forward-looking alternative. And again, I hope that you guys are thinking along those lines. The other thing was about 3D audio. So, very good work is being done by headphone companies and audio companies, Sennheiser, um, Bose, uh, Dolby Labs bought Doppler IP, uh, must be working in that area somehow. A lot of um, you know traditional uh, audio companies are, are working in the area of spatialization. On top of that, people like Google and Facebook and Microsoft have got spatial audio sections to their VR APIs and some excellent people working in those areas. Um, but for me, over the years, I've seen maybe a dozen 3D audio demos. And I've always been a bit disappointed. I never really bought it until I managed to get my personal HRTF done. Do you guys know about HRTF? Head-related re head transfer function. Everybody's physiology is different, right? When I hear sound, I locate it based on the minute differences between the way that it enters my ears and the occlusion of my, my ears, my skull. That's how I know where sound is coming from. And everybody's physically different. So the Algorithms that were put together that most of these 3D audio systems use are decades old. They're mostly done on sort of middle-aged white guys and not necessarily going to work for an Asian teenager. Um, and uh, unless you have a personalized HRTF, as I discovered, uh, you don't get the full benefit. But I went to the University of Maryland where they have this sort of booth where they, they put microphones in your ears and they, they record your... HRTF, and they gave me a little code file, and I plugged that into their 3D audio system, and I was just, my mind was blown. Now it was actually reality. So the issue really is that we need to calibrate 3D audio for our individual needs. And this makes me think that a few years down the road, what we call hearables are going to become de facto. So you're starting to see these it's kind of a hybrid between a hearing aid and a headphone, a wireless headphone, which will do more than just play your music. Uh, they have other functions, such as your communication, maybe translate into a foreign language, but more and more they're getting smart in the sense that they will selectively cancel out certain sounds from the environment, let you focus on the conversation of the person opposite you at the table in a noisy restaurant, those kinds of things. And these are fairly expensive. However, who would have known 10, 15 years ago that, you know, everybody would have at least one set of headphones today? You go into like an airport audio store, there's a hundred brands of headphones, right? That's become de facto like a pair of sunglasses. Everybody has to have one. And I think five or 10 years down the road, everybody's going to have hearables. And I think that this is going to be a combination of those functions that I talked about, and they will be personalized for your own HRTF. That may seem like a bit of a stretch, but people spend money on prescription spectacles, right? Because it improves the quality of life. Well, I actually think the difference is so dramatic when you have a personalized HRTF that I can see people spending four or 500 bucks going to a mall, going to spec savers, getting scanned, and ending up with a customized pair of hearables. And I think people would be quite happy to spend a few hundred bucks on those a few years down the road. The progress is being held up somewhat by wireless protocols. Classic Bluetooth has too much latency to do this very well. There are further um, advances in Bluetooth. By the time we get to Bluetooth 6, you might have low enough latency. And there's always a trade-off of bandwidth and quality. But eventually, again, this is going to get to a point where hearables will become a reality. And who knows, further on from that, we might have smart contact lenses instead of these clunky head-mounted displays or even neural implants in our heads. I don't know. But by the time my students leave with their degrees in music for new media, the whole landscape is going to be different. So my focus really, as I've said, is, is to show them how to navigate those kind of landscapes. While we're on the subject of being blinded by science, 
Um, <laughs> so, uh, my students are 19 and 20. They don't know who the heck I am. <laughs> Unless their parents said, go to Peabody, study with Dolby. They have no idea at all. So they get curious, right? So they go online and they look, they Google me, they go on YouTube and they look me up. And one of them found a music video of mine and came into class and said, yeah, I was checking out that video of yours, Professor Dolby. Who's the old guy, by the way? Is that your dad, Dr. Ray Dolby? <laughs> So I thought, you know, I told them the story about how that came about, and it's kind of a good story, so I thought I'd finish up today by telling you guys, if that's all right. So um, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, beginning of the 80s, as I mentioned, I was working with this uh, PPG wave computer doing solo one-man shows around South London, and I made my first album, The Golden Age of Wireless, and it came out in 1981, got great reviews, won awards, sold about three copies. So I did what the record company told me to do, and that was I got in a ferry and went across to Europe to find other territories in which maybe I would be more commercially successful, and I went over to the Netherlands, where this magazine decided that I had a Meester plan, whatever the heck a Meester plan is. And I went to Japan, where in 1982 I was voted Young Scientist of the Year. I wasn't so sure about this scientist thing, you know, because a lot of the pop stars of the day were people like Sting and Simon Le Bon and Adam Ant, and I wasn't going to compete with them in the poster boy stakes. Um, but I thought, okay, well, this could actually work if I were to have a bona fide scientist that made me look cool. I thought, if I'm going to be a scientist, I'm going to be a cool scientist. So I need, at the very least, a hot lab assistant and a vintage motorcycle combo. And I started coming up with this scenario uh, for a song, a little bit like a silent movie, uh, which involved me going to a home for deranged scientists, and there was a sinister sort of surgery taking place. And I wrote this in a storyboard. This is the very early days of music video. I took it into my record company, EMI, and I said, what do you think? Would you give me the budget to go make a video for this? And they said, well, when do we get to hear the song? And I said, ah, I went home that weekend and wrote the song and brought it into them on Monday morning. And uh, these were the first lyrics for the song. And I then thought, okay, so I need this bona fide scientist to have in the video. And I went through a copy of Casting Central catalog looking for suitable celebrities. And the BBC in those days had a sort of a, a cool line in like, you know, bizarre eccentric experts in different fields. And one of them was this guy called Dr. Magnus Pike. And uh, I was amazed to find in this casting catalog that Dr. Pike was horrible by the hour or the day. And so I hired him and had him come to my studio, which at the time was in the back of a meatpacking factory in a Victorian trading estate in Earl's Court. And uh, he came into my studio and he wasn't very impressed with the surroundings. So I got him out in front of the microphone and I gave him a sheet of paper with the lines that I needed him to read. And uh, he put on his headphones and he said, right then, Dolby, what was he wanted me to say again? And I said, I need you to say, she blinded me with science. And uh, this is what he said. She blinded me with science. <laughs> and I said, hey, that's great, but you know, it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. And he said... Yes, but as a known scientist, it would be a bit surprising if the girl blinded me with science. <laughs> so... Uh, so uh, I said, well, just humor me here, Dr. Pike. Um, maybe you could uh, just give me some wild tracks and I'll find a way to fit them into the song. And uh, um, <laughs> he said, well, I need, what's my motivation, Dolby? Um, <laughs> uh, surely you've got a beat in that box of yours. And uh, I said, well, it so happens I do. And uh, this is what I played him. He said, oh, that's a bit more like it. He said, uh, I said, okay, now give me some wild tracks. And he said, well, how about this? He said, science. I said, that's pretty good. Just a, a bit wilder than that. And he said, science. So good, not really wild, like a wild animal. And he went, science. And I said, okay, sounds like a hit to me. And uh, so uh, that was how we did it. And you don't need to hear the rest of the song, right?
Okay, guys, but you've got to help me out, all right? Come on, let's get some exercise. Let me see you on your feet. Give me a hand here. Come on, up again. Come on. Come on, AES, on your feet. If I'm going to do this, I want some help. Turn it up a bit. All right, here we go. Central catalog, you can hire any celebrity you want, just so you know. When I'm dancing close to her, blinding me with blinding fire. Sights. I can smell the Thank you. Enjoy the rest of AES, all right? You've been a really nice audience. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>